like today. You know, the day you just got done with, the work you just completed, the task you just finished, the job you were given and you finally arrived at some quitting time where you're able to stop and consider your day done. For me, I struggle at times inwardly with no one around, with my own inner turmoils that go on between the Lord and I and what I want to get done and still do and what I can't do because it's physically impossible for my body to go beyond this certain place where finally I'm just so tired that you know my eyes are like wow they're they're blurry eyed my tear ducts are kind of streaming a little bit and I'm kind of like tired and I just can't think straight because you see I'm always more excited to do more than I am excited to do less and one of the things I keep learning from God is that his ways really are more is less and I, I know that as a intellectual kind of like Bible study thing you know I mean I've taught that before that the whole concept of the mega church is foolishness because the idea that everybody in a mega church is saved is kind of like silly because really you're missing more people falling through the cracks than you are ministering to people that you think are there for the right reasons. The intimacy of the fellowship of what God had done while he was here on earth wasn't to build a bigger church, but a smaller one. And so while many are called, few are chosen. And so I, I see really kind of a, a reverse mentality of everything that we do in Gentile perspective as opposed to what God does in a Jewish perspective. Because you see, when I was in Israel, I found it really interesting. You know, everything there was called bigger than what they are. I don't want to say that things were grossly exaggerated, but I don't know. You know, I went to Jerusalem and I wouldn't call any of those hills mountains. Matter of fact, I finally had a pastor who was teaching. It's a church I go to. And he said something about visiting Israel. And then he said, he started to describe one of the towns in the Galil in Kfar Nahum, which is for most people Capernaum. Kfar Nahum is might be a Jewish way to say it, but in the Galil, the Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, and along the banks of the side, there are hills that aren't really mountains, not compared to the places if you've been to a mountain, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, I just live right now where the sun comes up, and it comes up over seven to 12,000, maybe 10,000 feet high. And I can see it from here when the sun comes up. I can see that mountain. And that's quite a sunrise because I'm over two hours away from it. And I go flat and then upward because I'm in the valley of the Sacramento Valley, the greater um, big valley, if you want to call it that, or the, the well, it's a giant, you know, <laughs> inland sea, so to speak, or flatland of California. But we know what mountains are. I've been to McLaughlin or Denali, you know, in Alaska. That's a mountain. <laughs> Giant. And other places, too, people have been to mountains. But most of the places I went to in Israel, they were hills. And when I saw the walls of Jerusalem, I had to keep reminding myself, if I dig down then I look up from down below and I look up the wall, that'll seem like a big wall. Otherwise, man, I've seen bigger skyscrapers. You know what I mean? So, a lot of times our perspective of some things is exaggerated to a degree that we probably aren't grasping the reality of what God wants us to be. For me, I often want to get, oh, I don't know, 30 or 40, maybe even 50 posts done and it just isn't going to happen I get excited because I find some great teachings and I want to repost them and then I get excited because then I'm reading them and then I want to post something about what I've read and I want to make a video like I'm doing now about what I've heard and seen and handled my own hands and the things that I've done and it's like I get all wound up and I'm like oh yeah let's go 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 keep going and keep going and it's a perpetuating cycle of doing more instead of doing less and you know, really, most people would be content with posting one 
post one quality piece. Not me, man. I want to do five or six, maybe ten or twenty. Get the word out. You know, I want to do more, be more, share more, tell more, talk more, experience more. It exemplify that with which God has done in my life so much more than what I'm doing. And I don't really live out the reality of the fact that more really is less. Because if you do less, quite frankly, you can make it impact more. And I know that in writing because, you see, when I wrote my books, and whenever I write a book, you write a book in huge amounts of flowing verse and prose, and you just go for it, then you start editing it. You edit it down and cut it and cut, 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 to just slash and gash, you know, and take all of the extra superfluous words out of it, you know, and bring back to the reality of just a, you know, short, concise statement that makes the imagination of the person reading it go where you want them to so that you're not stating what you want the person to see but they're imagining what you want them to see and the fewer words you use the better it is for the reality of that person enjoying the book more based upon what they interpret it to be not what you actually wrote it as and often writers will just let the person who read it say what they want to say about it if they're a smart writer and that's what happens a lot of times, I think, in ministry, is that people want to do too much, not less. And sometimes because there's such a desire to get more people involved, we don't reduce ourselves to the quality of the individuals that we have, but we try to implore more of the masses that we have attending, and we wind up kind of not comprehending what I think the will of God is. And in my personal opinion, when he said many are called but few are chosen, I feel that God is always reduced to say that more is less. And if we would use less, we would get more. See how that works? So whenever I see a megachurch, I avoid it like the plague because I already know it's a waste of my time. You know, There's nothing there that I really want. There's nothing there that interests me. When I was at Big Calvary, what we used to call Big Calvary, and it wasn't that big in those days, but it was big, you know, it was still growing, it'd come out of the tent, and just had the building, and the building was still, you know, kind of being developed in the ministries, and, you know, there was no, there was a field next door, you know, and there was like, Maranatha Village still existed, you know, <laughs> shows you how long ago. But it wasn't so big that you couldn't get to know people, you know, well, in a way you couldn't, you know, and that's what I kind of grew up with. And so I always went to the home fellowships, you know. Some of my best memories at Calvary were really some of the smaller studies, you know, that went on. And also some of the home Bible studies that were really tight and intimate. And when they grew, I left. Went to other places, did other things, you know. Moved on in the ministry that God had given for me to do and to experience and to learn so that I would be applicable to what he was trying to show me. And I think that's what's true now is that we see things like, even a Joel Osteen church that is so big in a football stadium, nobody needs to be doing anything for anyone at all except to be sitting entertained. They don't have to help one another at all. They got everything covered. People paid to do that. People respond to do that. Meanwhile, you can get away with not really paying attention. I mean, you could even probably text and not interrupt the service going on. You might even be able to watch a football game while it's going on. I wonder often in most of those churches that are megas, including Calvary chapels, what's really going on? What is reality and what is fantasy? And so at the end of my day, every day, I kick back, I think, and I started this series because I do that, that I wanted to consider and meditate on my day and the things that have gone on in it, then maybe I could share with you my hesitancies, my challenges, my things I don't feel are quite right, but I don't have a handle on it quite yet. And that maybe, maybe you'll feel the same way too, and that you'll consider the things that I'm sharing with you as a thought process, you know, kind of taking time to think about it, to ponder you know, to unwind. Because you see, my day, I can wind up, but I don't know how, quite frankly, to wind down because I want to do more. 
I want to share more. I want to relate more of the things that have gone on my day. And that's always fun to do because, you see, one of the things that I know about pastors and the ministry is that when they're in the pulpit or they're in front of people or they're doing what God wants them to do, there's a special, we call it an anointing, but there's a special extra oomph that they get, so to speak. Kind of an extra energy flow, an extra ability to feel from the people and from God to share the Word of God. And as they're doing correctly what God wants them to do, if they're moving in the center, as Chuck Smith used to say, of God's will, or if they're you know, moving in the current in the right direction and not going against the tide, then they, they feel that. There's this kind of like extra ability that God adds the increase by way of His Holy Spirit. And while you're in that moment doing that thing, there's that extra that you get. And so it's almost not quite the same as being addicted to some kind of hype like a rock star or like a worship leader who can get caught up in his worship as opposed to being a worship leader. But rather it's something that you know is there that's kind of like not taught well enough to respond to the pitfalls of ministry that sometimes pastors will make the mistake of getting overboard when God wants them to bring them lower board to the place where other people may be hurting or needing some individual attentiveness, sensitivity training to the reality of that church that if you saw someone up in the upper balcony and they were crying their heart out, would you stop the service to help them? Or would you go on for the many? Jesus said it wasn't so much the 99 that were important, but the one that the Good Shepherd went after. And I question every pastor and every ministry when I speak, when I teach, when I relate, when I share this kind of information, because I'm not knocking their ministry. I'm not knocking the anointing that they've been given. I'm not knocking the appointing that God has chosen them to be in charge of their own place that God has put them, because they get to determine that. They get to run it the way they see fit. But the reality of what they need to learn, I often wonder if while I'm sharing my considerations, they might also have the same feelings at times that maybe this isn't the right way to go and it's not all it's cracked up to be. Because you see, young pastors always want to grow up into these mega ministries. But sometimes some of the older pastors realize at some point in time, even Chuck Smith did because he talked about leaving Arizona one time, but you get to some place of time in your ministry where you go, maybe I should walk away and start something new. Maybe I should leave it to, to the elders or leave it to someone else and go and do you know, something else. Some people do it as a sabbatical, you know, they'll go off on a, a sabbatical and take time away from the ministry. Some people will go on a missionary outreach. Some people will go on a tour, you know. But knowing that God is teaching that less is more and that more is less, I wonder if the individuality of the personages of the followers of Jesus being in the disciples and the 12 that were intimate with Jesus in the 70 and the 120, that maybe we need to examine ourselves to see how we're dealing with this reality check that we're kind of like wanting to do so much more than what we're really maybe capable of doing or even maybe that God wants done. Because I wonder, is it really that important to bring everyone into the sanctuary? If maybe say you lose 60% that fall away? Would that be an acceptable loss? If you lost 80%, would that be an acceptable loss? Do you consider the loss of those? Or is it just, since they're in here, I got them as a captive audience, now I can let them go because after all, it's the Holy Spirit doing it and not me. I don't have to be may aware of those that came and are not saved or those that I see by the face and the look on their eyes that they're falling away. Do I need not be concerned? In ministry, the greater challenge isn't so much as recognizing those things as knowing what to do with those things when you see them. And that's kind of where I come to my conclusion on starting this video evenings, you know, is that I want to 
express those reservations I have and express the feelings that though I have done the will of God today in my life and I have run the race and finished the course and I know for today it was like wow so much got accomplished that when I wind down and think of these things then I consider the give and play the pull and take from what is posted what is presented and what really is done you see I know based upon my personal experience and the fact that I've done it at times is that most of what I post on the internet doesn't get read most of what I present on the internet probably doesn't get paid attention to a greater majority of the videos that I record and that are clicked on don't get watched they look at the titles and they look at the picture but they move on they don't watch too many of them few and far between I find some that watch and actually are ministered to and they share with me the reality of what they've experienced from God in the teaching ministry that's gone on in the video itself but the 90 percent according to Facebook statistics of what most people do is that they'll click on the first picture they'll see and never pay attention to what it says or what it really is they'll just make snap decisions quickly and flip by as though they were on a text phone and just flipping by and scanning through or doing like the Twitter thing where it's just scrolling by most of what's done then either is a waste or it's an opportunity and the challenge is always weighed in the scales of what God has told you to do to figure out whether you're going to be wasting your time or redeeming your time in the most profitable way for you to use that which God has given you the gift and the anointing that you are I have to play those games in my mind to think of those things to remind myself so the Holy Spirit will tell me when I'm gone too far because I've never done too little but when I've gone too far and I have gone to the extreme point of trying to throw a giant net into the ocean and save everyone's soul when the reality is many are called few are chosen less is more and the more I try to do the less I see those that are going to cling to that truth or reality that God has spoken to them. I see viral videos or I hear tell of them I don't even know where to find the viral videos because I've never really pursued them but I hear tell of viral videos that billions of people have seen that's interesting I don't think those videos or those videos are as important as the portent of what they indicate people are interested in and I find that there's a general theme about what most people are doing and I call it American tabloid Christianity because it seems to be an AT&T mentality that you know you, you're gonna thumb it through your Christian walk you know text it and kind of review it and do it only if you know you got a buzz from it and so you just flip through your little iPhone or your droid and you just keep going by with your thumb when Jesus said deny yourself take up your cross and follow me he wasn't talking about crucifying your thumb but I wonder if your thumb offends you would you not cut it off in order for you to enter in the kingdom of heaven if your right eye offends thee, would you not cut it out if your tongue would you cut it off the questions I have in my mind each day that I end my time that I'm fellowshipping with God I I find myself wondering what really have I accomplished in my life and in some few that I may have touched because I do reassure myself in the Holy Spirit I do confirm my ministry in the Word of God I do listen to the direction that God has given me and the inflection that he always gives me in the way that he tells me to do things and how he would have me to approach them but I still have always every day and until the day I die and I'm brought into glory to meet my Savior you know face to face and to 
Really, I know we, we go before him to get our reward, and the only thing I've told people is, quite frankly, I want a tree, and I want to sit under it, and I want to have maybe some grass, maybe a warm breeze, you know, and maybe, you know, a lake or a river nearby, and maybe, maybe, you know, some grapes growing or something, you know, but for the most part, I just want to sit for a thousand years and do nothing. I want to have a little garden, you know, that maybe I can play in, and maybe once in a while somebody will come by, like Abraham, Paul, maybe Peter, maybe you, maybe someone I don't know, and never met, and we could talk for a few minutes and break some bread and drink some wine and talk about what God had done in the previous age and what God is doing in the present age and how much peace there is for the thousand years that we're going to live here on earth. I enjoy that thought so much I went out and wrote a book on it. You know, and I have a series of books about what it would be like living in the millennium and I look forward to it. I really plan on enjoying that time of peace because God said that while it is day, the workers work in the day. But when it is night, the time will come when the workers cannot work for it is dark. And the time is coming soon when we can't do all that we want to do today. So for me, I guess in thinking about more is less and less is more, and many are called and few are chosen. I find myself challenged by the number of people that follow and then fall away from, you know, following me or leading or whatever, doing they do when they sign on and sign off or whatever. But I find that I'm always having to reaffirm to myself if I'm doing it just for the one, just the one, then. I'm doing it in the name of the Son, and I'll be content with just the one. And in some ways, you know, because we're evenings come and we're at the end of our day, I can admit to you and say to pray, but no, I'm not always content with just one. I'm always like everyone else that wants to do more, to be more, to accomplish more, to say more, to share more, to relate more about the things that God has done in my life. I know I get a thrilling kick out of the scriptures when they say, if everything should have been recorded that Jesus said and did, there wouldn't be enough volumes you know, in the universe to cover it. Whoever said that, and I know who said it, but let me just go with my thought. Whoever said that really was there, because they know what it's like to see things that were so wonderful you just can't help but keep trying to tell more about it, do more for it, act more with it, and live more out the faith that you've been given from the beginning even until the end of your age. Because for me, I've been a Christian now 2013, I can't think of it, let's see, in three years it'll be 40 years, is that what it is? 56? No. Gosh, I've been a Christian long... I can't even think of how long I've been a Christian. It's like my brain is tired from the end of the day. But I've been a Christian a long time. I got saved in... Oh, there we go. Next year, I'll have been a Christian for 40 years. Because I got saved in 74. Whew. Confused me. I was adding my birth date. You know, not my born-again date. But when I turn 40, should the Lord tarry, and I'm pretty sure He will, I just am amazed that I think I've only begun the work that God would have me to do. Because all along, yes, I've, I've shared and related and talked and you know, been in and out of ministry. I've been backslidden. I've been you know, married before. I've been all kinds of things, you know, all through life, done lots of things you know, that have gone on in my life. And I've never denied being a Christian, and I've always taken Jesus with me and always shared with everyone around me Jesus, you know, to a certain degree, you know, in some way. And each time I've grown more and more and more and more, you know, and, and I'm fascinated by how thinking that after 40 years it will have been that I have known Jesus and walked with Him and talked with Him, and it'll still feel like it's only been just the other day that 
him and I got together, he blew my mind. Even as today, he blew me away with all the things that I was graced with and allowed to be privileged to share and to pass on to other people. I don't know what your day was like today. For me, yeah, it was a pretty good day. Pretty good day. And you know, I thank God for it. Even though I may not stop doing what I'm doing yet, if I can stay awake. But I thank God upon, like Paul said, every remembrance of you, if you contact me in some way, or that I've had the opportunity to share with you as though you and I are very intimate and real, because whether you know it or not, in the spirit, we are. But for every time that I consider all the people that have watched the video, I have prayed for every one of you that you would see Jesus in some personal, intimate way that you've never known him before. And that at the end of your day, maybe more so than I am, you could be content that if you have less, then really you have more. And that if you, ha if you are one of those pastors or preachers, teachers, elders, deacons, whoever, whatever you're involved in, if you have more, then maybe you might consider less to the benefit of the reality of knowing God in a quality way as opposed to a quantity way. Because really, God wants you to have both. But he starts with the quality and ends with the quantity.